Hello and welcome to this short review of ionisation energy. Before we start, make sure you've got your independent study materials and any notes you've done in front of you because the clip's designed to go with some work that you've already done. So instead of giving you a specific um, definition for first ionisation energy or for second ionisation energy or for third ionisation energy, for example, which should be in your notes already, I'll take you through generally what the process means. So ionisation is the removal of an electron from each particle in one mole of gaseous atoms or ions to give one mole of gaseous ion with a positive charge one greater than the starting species. So for example, this equation represents the first ionisation of neon. This equation represents the second ionisation of beryllium. And this equation represents the fifth ionisation of chlorine. So hopefully you get the picture. So the species must be gaseous so that energy en any energy measured doesn't come from overcoming attractive forces between one particle and another. In other words, the only energy measured is as a result of the process that's described in the equation. So let's now look at the factors that affect this ionisation energy. So the nuclear attraction between a positively charged nucleus and the electron surrounding it determines the ionisation energy. So as you'd expect, anything which influences this nuclear attraction also influences ionisation energy. So if we take a nucleus that has three protons, for example, obviously it's going to have a charge of three plus. So we, if you, we now give it its requisite number of electrons, with two in the first shell and one in the second. But if the nucleus had four protons, because it's now got a charge of four plus, it would exert a greater nuclear attraction on the electrons. So our first factor must be proton number or nuclear charge. The greater the proton number, the greater the nuclear um, attraction. So I've now turned the atom into something more realistic. We talked about neon earlier, so I thought I'd use that. So it's got two electrons in its first shell and eight electrons in its, sh in its second shell. So clearly the nuclear charge is much stronger than before. But let's not run away with ourselves. The inner shell electrons exert repulsion on the outer shell electrons. In addition, the outer shell electrons are more shielded from the effect of the nucleus. So therefore the nuclear attraction is reduced by both these effects, which will reduce the ionisation energy needed to remove an outer shell electron. We can also say that the presence of inner shells increases the distance between the nucleus and the outer shell electrons, so the atomic radius has increased. So therefore this distance over which the nuclear charge must act reduces its effect and nuclear attraction decreases. So your main factors you need to discuss in terms of their effect on nuclear attraction are nuclear charge, shielding and atomic radius. So nuclear charge, provided shielding and atomic radius remain the same between two elements, increases nuclear attraction. In other words, more protons, greater attraction. So shielding reduces nuclear attraction even if greater nuclear charge. And the same can be said for atomic radius. So in the case of shielding, that is basically more shells, less attraction. And in the case of atomic radius, more distance, less attraction. So let's now look at some of the trends across the periodic table. So across periods you get the same shielding, because you have the same shell number, increased nuclear charge, because you have one more proton each time, and reduced atomic radius, because the increased nuclear charge draws the outer shell in closer each time. The resulting effect is that ionisation energy increases. But if you go down groups, the nuclear charge increases, but the shielding also increases, and this actually outweighs the effect of the increased nuclear charge. The atomic radius obviously also increases, so therefore the ionisation energy or the energy required to remove an electron, goes down. 
So if we look at this graph of first ionization energies, you can see an overall increase in first ionization energy across the periods. But you can also see peaks and dips along the way. And it's these peaks and dips which are of interest because they provide the evidence for the electron orbital model of atomic structure. So let's try and uh, go into some of these um, peaks and troughs and dips and try and explain what's going on. What you need to be able to do at this point is follow along with uh, drawing out the uh, electron configuration of each element as I go through them. So noble gases have the highest first ionization energies because, as you'd expect, their nuclear charges, the proton number that is, are the highest in their periods because they're on the far right in group 8. Looking at these two pairs, you can see that there's an increase in ionization energy in the second um, element in each case. The reason for this is the second element has a higher proton number. So beryllium and magnesium have one more proton than lithium or sodium respectively, but the same shielding. So therefore the ionization energy increases. It requires more energy to get, get rid of one of the electrons in the 2s or 3s um, orbital. So if we look at two more pairs, beryllium and boron, and magnesium and aluminium, you can see that in each case the second element takes a dip this time. That's because the highlighted electron, 2p1 and 3p1, is shielded because a new subshell is being filled. So let's look at some more trends as we move across. In this case you get a nice steady increase. There's no dips. So let's have a think about why this might be. So moving from P1 to P2 to P3, the electrons will go into separate orbitals to avoid repulsion. And therefore this allows the effect of the, um, the increasing proton number to raise the ionization energy steadily. So looking at nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur, they're in similar positions to each other. If we look closely at the P3 and P4 configurations in box and arrow form, we can see that the fourth electron, which I've drawn in red, has to share an orbital and therefore it experiences repulsion. Well, both of those electrons in that orbital, orbital experience repulsion. So one of them can be got rid of more easily. So therefore the ionization energy decreases. So this effect is less pronounced in sulfur and phosphorus due to extra shielding, but it does exist. Now the final part of uh, the ionization energy story at A level is the idea of successive ionizations. So if you look at an individual atom, you need to be able to use successive ionization energy data to identify the element based on predicting the number of electrons in its outer shell. So in a nutshell, what happens if you take more electrons one after another from the same atom? So let's take fluorine as an example. I've drawn out the, uh, the structure of the atom using the GCSE model. What would happen if we now got rid of an electron? And then continue that process further. As you'd expect, it gets harder and harder to remove an electron from an ion that itself is becoming more and more positively charged. So if we draw a set of axes of ionization number plotted against first ionization energy, you can see quite an interesting trend. You'll notice there's a big jump at the eighth ionization. Now this indicates that there's a new shell um, closer to the nucleus which is having the electrons removed. So it's obviously is experiencing much stronger nuclear attraction. So therefore the ionization energy jumps significantly. So the fact the first seven ionizations that happened before this indicates there must be seven electrons in the element's outer shell. So the conclusion is that the element must be in group seven. So it doesn't matter how they give you the data, it might be as a graph or it might be as a table, you'll need to be able to make this type of deduction from more challenging ionization energy questions. Okay, so that concludes our review of ionization energy. It's time now to go and try some examples to see if you can put it into practice. Thanks for your time and see you next time.